We're in a pandemic, but it's time for academics. So let's make sure you all pass this credit. It's a new year to learn about the planet. Like Lincoln Park, we'll be theorising in hybrid. Your temperature matters, so does the temperature of the planet. Some of us are gonna be on campus. We're all gonna try not to spread this virus. Wear a mask when you're in class. We're in a pandemic, but it's time for academics. So let's make sure you all pass this credit. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back to EMBS 110. Today, I want to talk about democracy again. I always want to talk about democracy. But in the last videos, we introduced the National Environmental Policy Act and how it structures the environmental policymaking process and how it influences environmental impact statements. In this video, I want to take a step back from that and revisit the question of how democratic that is. Now, if you think about what a democracy is trying to do, it's trying to take everyone's opinions and turn them into one choice. People might vote for lots of different reasons. You might be voting for a given candidate because of their climate change plan, because of their education plan. You might dislike their position on race, but like their opinion on foreign policy. And all of those things get put together in your head and come out as a choice for candidate A or candidate B. But when you mark the paper, the paper doesn't know why you did what you did. It doesn't tell us whether the person won you over because of their climate change plan or because of their position on policing or their position on foreign policy or anything else. But all of that information existed, presumably, in your mind as you were making up your mind. So, if you were to think about it as an equation, every single person has all these different pieces of algebra that are adding up in their heads, pros and cons about different candidates. There are millions upon millions of voters, and each of their equations is slightly different. If there were a machine, an engineering problem, that could somehow take all of that information from our heads and weigh it all up and mix it all together and spit out one coherent choice, that would be such an incredibly complicated mathematical function. And this is why social science, even though it maybe isn't seen as, as rigorous as the natural sciences, can actually be much more complicated because there's so much stuff going on in people's heads that we're desperately trying to measure. And democracy is desperately trying to measure public opinion. What does the public want? What do the people want? Now, the National Environmental Policy Act gives us a process for soliciting public input. But does it fit our definition of democracy? So we've been working with two definitions of democracy so far. The first, that a government should be limited in that it can't take away your basic rights. It should be accountable in that you can get rid of politicians who do things you don't like. And it should be representative in that politicians should gain power when they promise to do something that you do like. The second definition of democracy was a process, thinking about it like a circle. We begin with public opinion, that gets translated through elections into a legislature. That legislature writes laws that get implemented by a bureaucracy. The judiciary can step in if that law turns out to be unconstitutional, but as long as it's constitutional, it gets implemented and we see the results. Once we see the results, we make up our mind about who we want to vote for next time. And the circle of democracy continues. Are those two definitions met by the National Environmental Policy Act? How can we make sure that they are? If we want to be democratic, how can we make sure that we are? So, the question I want to raise in the rest of this video is that votes are not the only way to make your voices heard. They might not even be the best way to make your voices heard. Sometimes they are, but there might be things that you want to express, like the intensity of your preference, or the specific reason for your vote, that you can't use a vote to communicate. And so you have to use other means to communicate it. You might also have opinions that aren't reflected in any of the choices you're able to make. 
And so you can't express yourself with a vote. You might have an opinion about something that politicians aren't talking about. Then your vote can't express your opinion as a member of the public. People are different in lots and lots of ways. I want to go through a few like somewhat light-hearted ways in which people are different, but if you think about the vigorous political debates that we're having in the run-up to November, you can hopefully see that like this is a relatively easy way for us to talk about a much more complicated and, and sort of difficult topic. So these two charts show a map of states that have a lot of Walmarts in them and states that have a lot of Starbucks in them. Think if you were to ask most people what are your stereotypes of people who go to Starbucks, they would come up with a certain set of characteristics and maybe those match up with the states that have the most Starbucks. But the idea behind showing these is that this doesn't sum up every difference between those states. It doesn't fully characterize all of these different places. In politics, if there are different types of states, they might want different types of policies as a result. If states want different types of policies, a good democracy should reflect that in the types of policies that it gives you. But it's not necessarily just states that matter here. We could also go down to the county level and say, like, what are some differences in counties that might affect the types of environmental policies that people want? Perhaps there are some counties where people do a lot of outdoor, like, hiking and stuff, and maybe those are places that might have more push for environmental policies. But maybe that's not true. Maybe it's the states where people aren't doing a lot of hiking that actually need and want more environmental protection so that they can change. But we might not know if that's true either. There's a lot of heterogeneity out there, and a democracy has to decide what types of heterogeneity it wants to reflect, because it can't reflect all of them. You can't have 360 million different environmental policies for every person in the United States. The final slightly facetious type of difference between states I want to talk about is this set of data from Match.com, as shown by Yahoo News. Yahoo News Probably you ought to check on some other news sites to see if it's actually true, but if there is a hedgehog stuck in a bag of Doritos somewhere, Yahoo News will make sure that you know about it. So it has that going for it at least. Anyway, I don't know how people spend $160 on a date in Illinois. Maybe that price is being inflated by Chicago numbers, but in Galesburg, I just, I mean, I do not have my fingers on the pulse, but that seems like an inordinate amount to spend. You could have you have a great time at the gizmo for like ten dollars. Um, anyway, these might be differences that we want our political system to reflect. These could be politically relevant opinions. The, the slightly less facetious way to talk about these differences is to look at electoral maps. Perhaps there are some counties that are more Republican, some states that are more demographic, more democratic I mean. These are the maps from 2016 showing uh, in red the places where Republicans won, in blue the places where the Democrat won. Although some states are red states and some states are blue states, if you look on the county level it's actually a lot more complicated than that. It gets even more complicated when you look at population centres. I'm not sure if the chart on the left uh, is visible here, but the spikes represent population density. So there are a lot of um, high blue population centres there, meaning that in the big cities people tend to vote Democratic. So maybe a good democratic process would have different policies for the cities and different policies for rural areas. The four maps closest to me represent how people vote in different income brackets in different states. So if you earn under $30,000 a year, you basically always vote blue, except for that one state, maybe Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, there's like one state that's a little bit red where people earning under 30 skew slightly Republican, but everywhere else, the less you earn, the more likely you are to vote Democratic. In the 30 to 50 bracket, in most states that's a blue income bracket, but in some states, I'm not going to try and guess which ones those are, uh, they're more Republican. In the 50 to $100,000 a year income bracket, most people vote Republican, except for in the Northeast, where richer people still vote Democratic, and in the 100 to 200,000, people in California are different from everywhere else in the country. Everywhere else in the country, if you earn $100,000 plus a year, you tend to skew Republican, but on the West Coast and on the East Coast, that's not true. So what this means is there are politically relevant differences between people, not just based on where they live, but on 
whether they're in a city or not, on whether they earn a particular income or not. And all of these differences might be relevant. A democratic system can try to pick them up through means other than voting. And so if we have all of these differences between people, differences about how much exercise we do, differences about how much we spend on dates, differences on where we live, how much we earn, all of these other things, we also have differences on environmentalism, and that shouldn't be a surprise. So people who are democratic tend to be more supportive of environmental protection, people who are Republican tend to be less supportive of, envir of environmental protection, but there's still a majority in favour of it in both parties. So what are we trying to channel when we ask a policy-making process to be democratic? Are we asking it to channel only the opinions people give us at the ballot box? Or do we want to look at the sheer amount of heterogeneity in the US and say, a democratic system should be more than just checking in once every four years? The National Environmental Policy Act gives people a chance to give public input. It maybe doesn't offer that chance equally to everyone, but it does offer some ways for the public to make their voices heard outside of the electoral system. And I think that's interesting because it challenges our idea that public opinion is just what people say in polls or what people say uh, at election time. The types of input that people can give, the ways that you can get involved with, you know, making collective decisions are actually much broader than just the type of democracy that the US has been running for the past couple hundred years. So that's the question I want to leave you with today. What is the will of the people? Can it be expressed only through votes or could you solicit it some other way? I think that's interesting. I think that's exciting. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Cheerio. Let's roll the credits.